uh, giving you, I think, a brief practical introduction to a couple of machine learning algorithms. And if you're not familiar with, with machine learning, I want to explain what that is and give you an example of a use case with neural networks and random forests and kind of explain a couple of their advantages and disadvantages. Um, so if you have any questions, anytime, please just raise your hand and shout at me. I might, it might be kind of hard for me to see because of the sun, so just shout if I don't respond. So first of all, what is machine learning? So it's, one way to think about machine learning is it's kind of a form of artificial intelligence. It's exactly what, you, what it sounds like. Machines are learning, right? And in our particular case today, we're going to be using computers to learn from data to be able to try to make predictions or classifications uh, based on, based on uh, data that it's been trained on. Um, so a great thing about machine learning is that a lot of statistical methods, standard statistical methods, uh, don't work really well in big or unstructured data, especially, because a lot of statistical methods require, kind of depend on um, basic assumptions about distributions. You want to understand something about the data before you start, and uh, maybe they depend on some sort of linearity assumptions. So for example, principal components analysis, which a lot of you might have heard of, linear regression, these are all linear models. Um, so the great thing about uh, machine learning is that you can become much more flexible. And the trade-off is that you have to use computing power, and it makes it somewhat harder to understand what's going on sometimes. So a lot of companies use machine learning. Um, most, most of you are victims of machine learning whenever you get ads on Facebook. Um, SendGrid probably uses machine learning, although I'm not completely sure. Uh, I just want to give them a shout out. And uh, a lot of machine learning algorithms have a lot of really cool names, which you probably can't read. But neural networks, random forests, support vector machines, naive bays, there's like so many cool names. Um, and a lot of really cool algorithms behind them. So neural networks, what is a neural network? So it's also called an artificial neural network. Um, and we'll be spe using a special one called a multi-layer perceptron. I'm not kidding. They're based on the structure of the nerve and the nervous system in the human body, or any kind of nervous system. So you picture neurons lined up, and they either fire or don't fire, or maybe they fire with a certain amount of weight. And what you're doing is you, to do machine learning on a neural network, is that you train this network based on your data to give you the outputs you want with the inputs you want. So it's very similar to how our brain, brain works. So they're extremely general. They can be used for almost any kind of machine learning problem. Nonlinear problems, in fact, there are mathematical theorems that say that neural networks can be used to model essentially any kind of uh, function that you run into. And they can be made extremely accurate. So there's a famous uh, machine learning case, case problem called the MNIST problem. It's a digit recognition problem. And hundreds and hundreds of different algorithms have been, um, have been published or tried in the literature and a neural network is still the winner after all this time. Um, so disadvantages, let's see, I can read them off of my screen. So they can be kind of hard to interpret. It's a black box model, so a neural network is a black box model, which is a serious problem sometimes, especially if you're trying to make your case to somebody who wants to implement some of your, some of your recommendations. Um, they also require a good deal of data pre-processing to be able to work, so, and they also require a lot of tweaking to get good results. So if you have missing values, for example, your standard neural network algorithms don't handle them well. So this is a serious issue. And you have, or maybe if you have some sort of outliers, things like this, you have to rescale the data, and we'll see all this later. They're also prone to overfitting. So neural networks are so extraordinarily accurate that a lot of times you'll end up overfitting to your training data, which means um, that, so I think the simplest example is suppose you had data that should fit along some line. And you can see this if you just eyeball it. It's just got a bunch of dots, and they kind of all follow, follow a linear pattern. Well, if you run a neural network on it, it could end up that your neural network will not match, will not detect the linear structure. It'll actually detect this ex completely accurate uh, model for all of the noise. Um, and this would be a serious problem if you're trying to predict something based off of this. You're not going to get a good answer, right? So that's, that's what overfitting is. It's a serious problem in a lot of machine learning work um, because the models are just so completely general and so powerful that you end up overdoing it. Um, so there are a lot of ways that you have to fight this with neural networks. So here's a picture of a neural network, which is almost completely useless. It actually is fine if you just see the top half. So you have input neurons, 
and there are three here. Then you have a hidden layer of neurons, and then you have output neurons. So the premise is that you're bringing in, in this case, you might be bringing in three uh, variables, right? A, a something that's like a three-dimensional kind of data set, right? And, or, and uh, the processing happens between the input and the hidden layer, and the hidden and the output layer. And then the output layer spits out your answer. So what you do with a neural network is that you train the so-called weights on the input and hidden layers to, uh, to, out, to output the right data, or output the right pattern uh, for your data. Um, this, is, this can be really general. You always only have one input and one output layer, but you can have more than one hidden layer. Um, most applications, you only need one or two, though. So, so that's not something to worry about too much. Why don't you mean one or two hidden layers? Sorry? One or two hidden layers? Is that one or two is often enough for a lot of, for a lot of applications. So are you aware of, uh, what that was that? Are you referring to Ruben Hart's backpropagation networks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that we prove that one hidden layer is sufficient as long as right. it's Right, exactly. That, that, that's right. So, so he's right. In principle, in principle, one hidden layer is, is completely, completely uh, sufficient to model any kind of like, piecewise continuous function. So that's the, that's the theorem. Right? I think it's piecewise continuous is the, is the hypothesis. But I guess in principle there are functions that aren't piecewise continuous, and I think two hidden layers is enough to model a much even more general set of functions. I think you need you need uh, maps from finite sets or finite or finite intervals or something like that in order for it to in principle work with one. This is completely not useful. So one hidden layer should be enough to model I mean for for most of you you might not know what I'm talking about. But one hidden layer or two hidden layers should be plenty, and one hidden layer is almost always going to be enough. Okay? Any questions before I go on? Thanks for pointing that out. Okay. So we're going to talk about the multilayer perceptron, which is maybe the best name in all of machine learning. Um, I'll call it MLP. This is a particular kind of neural network. Um, so. The way that I think about training, meaning that you're you're teaching it to, to map the map the right way that you want, give you the right patterns for your inputs, um, you can think of it as essentially curve fitting with an almost arbitrarily complicated function. So, the structure of the neural network is almost a guide for how your um, for how your uh, kind of curve fitting is going to work, and there are just a huge number of parameters that you can tune. To match uh, to match your data. So the way this works is that for each layer, you're going to take a weighted sum of the inputs, and then you'll plug this into a function called an activation function. Then you output again to the next layer, take a weighted sum again, plug it into the activation function again, and you repeat this for as many hidden layers as you have. Oh, this is pretty really good. Okay. <laughs> One more. Okay. One more. The time you do after the sun goes down, we'll okay. figure it out. It's a good thing we're not using some of the gaps. Yeah, exactly. Move the south a little bit. Yeah. What's that? Move the south. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I did it. I did it. I did it. I did it. Okay. Great. <laughs> this is really good that you guys can see this now because this is the first the first slide where you don't want to just see it in your head, right? So so you're doing this process where you're repeatedly plugging outputs of weighted sums from your from your neurons into this activation function, right? And you can think of your activation function as kind of like what's causing the output from your neuron. So in a very simple kind of system, your activation function could maybe only be one or zero. You're thinking of this as like a neuron either being on or off. But for more general applications, we want to use something called, in general, a sigmoidal function. That's what this is called. Um, you might recognize this if you've ever done logistic regression, because this is the same, the same function that pops up. And in fact, it can be shown that a uh, multilayer perceptron with zero hidden layers for classification is equivalent to logistic regression. So that's a pretty cool statement. But it turns out that you can do logistic regression with neural networks. So once you get all these outputs, from these uh, activation functions and weighted sums, you put them in something called a cost function, and you'll have different cost functions for different applications. But this is a simple one. You're taking your outputs minus your inputs, you're squaring them and adding them up. It's a little bit like what you do in a standard deviation or something like that. 
and you're just measuring how far away the outputs your neural network is giving you are from the actual outputs that you should be getting if your neural network were perfect. Okay, are there any questions about this? I'm going to show you a nice diagram of this now. It's a flow chart. Um, I, learned, I learned yesterday that there are actual meanings for the boxes and shapes of the boxes in the flow charts, but none of these boxes have any meaning. So, don't worry. <laughs> so, the first step is that you have all these weights, they're your parameters. In order to use the neural network, you don't have to understand all of this, so don't worry, but it just helps to have a sense of what's going on. So you randomly initialize the weights, usually, and then what you do is you, here, here's your data, your variables, you feed the data in, right, so it goes in your input layer, and then the red arrows are the activation function being applied, right, and then you're taking weighted sums uh, along the way, redoing it at the hidden layer, so you can see the hidden layer is kind of giving you more parameters to work with, right? It's giving you more flexibility because you have more weights. Yes? Is this similar to the EM algorithm we used in NLP? I don't know. No, no, no. no. It's basically a cost function. You're minimizing it with respect to the weight value from the cost function. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. That's a big derivative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. That's a nice way to think about it. This is something I didn't want to talk about too much because it's kind of technical, but basically you can think about it as curve fitting, and if you're familiar with this, you have parameters and you're going to take the derivative of your cost function, or the gradient, and you're trying to you move along the gradient in the direction of the gradient, or maybe the negative direction of the gradient, to try to make the cost function smaller. So this is similar to cal in calculus. If you have some sort of function and you want to know where it's maximized or minimized, you set its derivative equal to zero, right? It's the same idea. And if you want to find where that point is, then you move in the directions of the, of the derivative. It's the same way in m many, many dimensions. We're doing that here. Okay. Yes? Are you going to go over the pitfalls of neural networks? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, and if you have any others that you'd like to add, I'm happy to mention. Okay. So, so we... <laughs> yeah, he's, I think he's a true expert. Okay, so once you've outputted, then you check the accuracy against your cost function, and then you do this so-called gradient descent method, right? You say, is the cost function small enough, or is it close enough to a minimum? And then if it's not, then you change the weights, you adjust the weights in a clever way, plug it back in, and redo the process. So it's kind of an iterative process, and at each time, you should be getting closer to a good neural network. So how do you know when you're converging, and how do you know when you're diverging? Yeah, so well, it's hard to know, right? This is, a, this is a difficult thing with neural networks, is that there's not a lot of good like mathematical results knowing exactly when you're going to converge and when you're not, right? This is a seriously fundamental problem, right? Well, but, the, but what you do in practice is that you just take these derivatives and you just say, okay, if we're really close to a minimum of our function, then the rate of change of the function should be very small, should be close to zero, right? So the same idea is happening with these gradients. When the gradient of the function, which is like a multivariable derivative, when all the gradients are extremely small, when they're less than a certain threshold, then you know that you're close to the minimum. And so you kind of move until that threshold is met. And maybe it depends on, on, this, on how, how small you want it. Okay, we have another so, expert. So mathematically, if you hit a local minimum, right, there's no way of knowing. Right, exactly. Sure. Yeah, and that's so, a, so, right. so you're dependent on some smoothness, right? In a certain if, sense, yeah, but if it's, if it can be very, if, as long as it's continuous, uh, right, in these kind of situations, it'll work. That you have hit a, map, a global minimum or a local minimum. Okay, I think because we shouldn't talk too much about this because we don't want to get, <laughs> we don't want to, I mean, a lot of people here are not professional mathematicians. Yeah, John. Generally, when, you, when you're training this, do you use a subset of the data or do you use all of your training data and then redo? Or do you use an example and then waiting? Uh, actually, it would actually be really helpful if you talked about computation time for training because it seems like yeah, yeah, okay. how um, that scales is how, how yeah. much you're going to be so, limited on your training. Right, right, right. right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want to, let's see, I want to check the time. It's just some sort of. You know what? We want to start getting okay. worse in their own networks. Yeah, yeah. This is presentation. Just keep going. And going and yeah, no, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Let's, let's continue and then we'll talk all about some of these some of these technical issues at the end. Um, but please keep asking questions, it's good. I'm glad that I'm made stimulating everybody's interest. That means I'm doing a very good job. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Okay, so here's a simple application of neural networks using R, which will be really nice for a lot of people to see because you don't have to understand gradient descent to be able to just implement, implement it. You can actually do a very good job because there are really nice models built into R. 
It's a good reason to learn R because you'll be surprised at how easy it is to code these things. So um, we're taking data from Kaggle, which is a nice website that has data mining competitions from which you can actually win money if you do a good job. Um, and in this, but this particular problem um, is predicting predicting um, financial distress, which would cause you to have delinquent accounts um, within the next two years. So you have some basic credit information, and the data is 150,000 individuals and their credit information. So for example, um, you can kind of see, so here's a one or a zero depending on whether they, whether they go delinquent in the next two years, right? And then you have their, I think, revolving utiliza utilization of credit lines, you have their age, you have, um, I think, the number of credit lines, debt ratio, monthly income, things like this. And a lot of, uh, just basically a bunch of basic information that any credit bureau will have about you. And then the goal is to predict, um, using some sort of data mining algorithm, um, on an unknown set of data, what will happen. So you're not given, you have like a test, you have test data which, for which you don't know the answer, and you try to predict on that test data. And that's how these Kaggle competitions work, is that you plug them in, and there's a leaderboard, and at the end, whoever's on top basically wins. Okay. So, any questions about the goal of the the goal of the problem? Okay, it's a pretty simple simple idea. So, we're, I'm going to show you how you apply this uh, on with a neural net. So, uh, don't pick on me about any of my uh, coding or documentation or anything like the way it looks. I know some people are actual professional programmers. So. All we're doing here, it's very simple. We're installing the packages that we need and setting the working directory. That's not interesting at all. And then we're importing the data, and then we're doing some cleaning. So we're imputing the data, meaning that there are missing values, which you can't really have with this particular algorithm. And you're filling them in, and there are a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, for this example, I did a very simple way, where if you have a missing value, you just fill it in with the average of the column, right? the average of the variable. That's all. And then we're scaling it. Right? It, it's not strictly necessary to do this with a neural network, but it helps. So if you would implement a neural network and some variables are much, much larger on average than others, then it's going to be much, much slower and it might not even work well. Right? Just in practice, you're going to have serious issues. So remember that if you do neural networks. Fill in the missing values and scale them. Right? Scale them. And scaling means that you just uh, basically subtract off the mean of the column, subtract off the average of the column, and divide by the standard deviation. So that means every column is going to be around the same size. Okay. Any questions about that? So that's all this first page is. Um, and this is just basic R stuff. And then this is implementing it. And I kept the variable names really verbose so you could see some of the different variables. And we're using something called the neural net package. So you can just, this is a standard kind of package that you can install. It's easy to build it in your library. Um, and all you do, the code is just you say the variable you want, which is this serious DLQ in two years, and then all the variables you're modeling it with, and then what data you're using, which in this case we're only using the first 10,000 entries. Um, I only did that for, for speed. I actually tried it later with 100,000 entries, or almost all the entries, and you don't actually get much of a better answer, surprisingly. In fact, your answer will get worse unless you lower this gradient pressure, because I think you might start to overfit a little bit. I'm not sure how that why, but it's tricky. Um, we say one hidden layer, we're using a particular kind of error function or cost function. I showed you one before. This is not, what, not really worth worrying about. This one we picked because we're trying to classify. And then we're telling it to output the probabilities and we're telling it the threshold. So actually, you could, for, a class, for your average classification problem, you could basically just copy this code and use it yourself. It should work. And I'll send it to you if you're interested. Um, yes? Are neural nets considered classified? Classifiers or well, they can do almost general. anything, right? I mean, a neural network is extremely general. And the cool thing, this is one really cool thing about a neural network. It's so general that um, because you can change your activation function if you want, and you can change your cost function. And if you change those things, then you can get it to model most situations. Maybe, and in principle, almost any situation, because it can model in any function, right? So some of the other machine learning algorithms talk about similarity and distance functions. Exactly. So do you use equate to those at all? <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In a certain sense, I mean, there are a lot of machine learning algorithms that are really specifically for classification or specifically for regression, right? So regression meaning trying to plot some sort of maybe continuous type of function or something like that. Um, neural nets are extremely general, um, and they can be used for, for a lot of these tasks. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 
So it's a difference to higher level. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah. Higher level. It's, it's high level in the sense that it, that it's very it's very general. general. Yeah. 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 Question. Like, yeah. Back. Question about categorical variables. Mm -hmm. Can you add those in, or you have to? They all have to be. Um, no, it's it's not really a problem. I don't think. I think it's it's well, fine. R will take care of it. Yeah, R will just do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the algorithm is, is pretty robust, actually, which is nice. Any other questions before I go? Yes. How long did that take to execute? Uh, a few minutes. It's really fast. Maybe even less than that. With only ten thousand data points, it's extremely fast. One thing to point out is that adding a hidden layer, adding two hidden layers. It didn't even finish on my computer. I just stopped eventually. It was very bad. Um, so that's a really important thing. You might be tempted to add a second hidden layer for accuracy, but maybe it's not going to be more accurate. Maybe it'll just stay forever. Right? Um, and even adding in much more data points still didn't take very long. Maybe 15 minutes. And I, I mean, you can see my computer. It's, I'm not working with like neighborhood simple, stuff. The simple reason is because it was exponentially as you have to Yes, exactly. And that's yeah. why it doesn't. That's right. And it's, it's not, I guess it's not so hard to see why why the, the time should grow as the, the time grows exponentially as you as you increase the number of hidden layers. It's just based on, if you kind of spend a few minutes thinking about the algorithm, it kind of makes sense. You're adding kind of an exponential more number of weights to, to optimize. Right. Okay. I want to keep on time. So let's see. When am I supposed to be done? 7.30, right? Yeah. Okay. We have plenty of time. Great. Okay, so all this is this is running the algorithm, and it does it, it doesn't take very long, surprisingly. Um, and this is not this is not a trivial problem. It's like a real life problem that could really, really make a really do something with it, right? And then this is just putting the code, or this compute function allows you to predict from new data. So that's the next thing you need to know. Um, and you can basically copy this with your own data, and it works really nicely. And then I'm just outputting it to a CSV, and you just get a CSV with a bunch of variables from your test data set like with the unknown answer, and then plus the prediction, the probability of defaulting in the next two years. So how well did it do? That's a good question. Well, it worked really well, I think. Um, it got like this AUC, don't worry about what AUC means, but it's approximately 85% accurate compared to what it should be according to the, the actual uh, test data set. Um, and that's actually really amazing if you think about it, because I only used 10,000 of the data points, took just a few minutes, these completely stock R code, 10 lines or 15 lines or something, and the winner of the competition out of 900 teams um, actually only got 87%. That's pretty remarkable, actually, how good of a job the stock code does. So a lot of the people who are winning these competitions are using the most advanced stuff, but half the time what wins is pre-processing the data better, for example. Right? Did I have a question for that? Yes. How does that compare if you had just done something of a logistic regression, maybe with some nonlinear transforms on your dependent variables? I didn't try that, but um, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> that's No, it's okay. That's a good, that's a very good question. I don't, I don't think it would perform very well, or not, just, not as well. Well, I would expect it wouldn't yeah. perform as well, but it'd be interesting to see kind of yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, because the logistic sure. regression is a simpler algorithm. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the logistic regression is like a simpler version of the neural net. Right? Exactly. That's one way yeah. to think about it. Yeah. I mean, I guess we could try hidden equals zero and see what happens. Yes. So my guess is, and I don't remember the competition, they probably had some contextual knowledge that they use, right? I think so. I mean, yeah, people, the people who, who won the competition, I think, did a ton of data cleaning and thinking about what really what the, really the data meant, right? That's the way you really win these things. Because the amazing thing is, so there's one really important thing to know about these machine learning algorithms, is that in a certain sense, the really advanced ones are going to predict very similarly well in a lot of situations because they're so general, right? Um, so if you're going to win, if you're going to do the best possible, it's going to have a lot to do with really understanding the data, right, and dealing with the data itself very well. Right. Yes. So the, the real question is, and this is relevant for everyone, is when you're going with the neural network, you're totally agnostic, right? Because you don't know the meaning, like the question there about category. Right. The neural network is totally agnostic, right? It's right. like a dumb black box. And in both, I don't know. What I was going to say is, if you had done a little bit of tweaking, like if you knew the dimensionality problem, could you have Across the 0.869% accuracy, or oh, sorry, 869 percent accuracy by just adding a little vector on. Well, I don't think so because the winners already did that. <laughs> yeah, well, sorry. but you could have done it in you know 30 minutes on your laptop. That's, right. That's yeah, that's right. Rates. Yeah, yeah. There's exactly. a fail. There's not one. Yes. 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 Does the uh, R implementation implement uh, regularization functions and things that uh, I don't try to deal with noise and overfitting? 
I don't think so. You know, the R, the R application, there's actually a really nice paper that you can look up that explains everything that they do. And it's it's called resilient back propagation. It's, it's a it's maybe the simplest really good algorithm for for doing these. It's just using the gradient descent um, with the sm with small steps and you can tell it how small the steps are. So, so it's not any different from the standard uh hard those guys. No, I don't think so. I think it's it's pretty much the same. Yeah. So so what are the guidelines for uh, 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 training data selection? You have uh, sample size. You have sample size, and then windows on the data. And, and from what you have up here, it looks like you just took ten thousand random entries. And yeah, I actually, you then did something even more. I just took the first ten thousand. right. Super so, simple. So then the question becomes: What's the sensitivity to, to input, and, and how do you judge when you've got? A, the right sample yeah, size, yeah, and B, the right stuff to it. So this is something I don't have a, a slide on, but it's really nice to hear about. So if you're ever doing some sort of machine learning, this even works if you're doing like statistics with kind of difficult data sets. You do something called cross-validation. So this is actually a really easy thing to understand. You can see why it works. So if I were to do this in a really great way, um, what I really did is just tried it and then plugged it in against and tested it against Kaggle to make sure it worked, right? But what you can do to do a really good job is what's called cross-validation. So maybe you split your data set into 10 pieces. So you do a random, random sample of 10 parts of your data, right? So each one is the size of 10% of your data. So you have 10 boxes, right? And then what you do is you train your algorithm on the first box. And then what you do is you test it on the, on another box, right? Or maybe the other, or some other selection of the data. And the 10% thing is not important. You can do it in other ways. And then that tells you, okay, did I do a pretty good job on this 10%, right? This is with all with data that you already know, right? This is all with your training data. And you'd say, okay, this didn't do a very good job, so let's tra let's change it, right? So you're splitting your data into different pieces, right? And you're training on the different pieces and then measuring on the other parts. Right, so this is a, this is called cross validation because you're validating across your own data set. Right, it's like A/B testing on steroids. Yes, yes, exactly. Should you always do a cross validation with a neural net? Well, I mean, if you want to, if you want to be pretty confident in your results, you always should. Right, right. I'd say I'd say that you should always do cross validation with any any machine learning algorithm at any time. Um, but it's really it's really pretty easy to do a decent job. Just split your data even in half, and you can do an okay job. Or in thirds, train it on only one third, test it on the other part, right? And you'll do a pretty decent job at being able to tweak your your neural net or whatever algorithm it is, and uh, know that you're not just like kind of cheating, right? You're not just testing. You're not training it on the whole data set every time, because then all that's going to happen is you're just you might just overfit on that particular part of your data set. Does, it, does anybody have any questions on that? Does that make sense? Yes. I think it is very good for this particular you know problem. The ones that are wrong, are they over or underestimating, or they have to have work That's a good over. question. I don't actually know. Yeah. Yes. Another reason the like, cross validation is important, uh, especially if you're including something called a development a test set or a development a data set, is you can use part some of those samples of data or subsets of samples uh, to, to help uh, choose metaparameters. Uh, so, so if there are metaparameters that you want to tw twiddle in order to get closer to Kegel's, you know, the, the, the winner's solution and such like that, you, you have to do that. So you, you pull out part of the data randomly, train it on that, test it on another random selection of the data, uh, and see what happens when you when you modify your, your metaphor. Right. So this is like uh, bootstrapping, if you're familiar with statistics. Right? It's a sort of a similar idea. The cross-validation is sort of in the same spirit as bootstrapping. Right? Um, OK. Are there any questions about this? Yeah, yeah, it, this is a good question. This question is, would it matter if only a small percentage of your data, for example, data points were delinquent or not, right? So if too, if too few of them were, you might have some trouble, that's right. Um, because you're, you're not going to have that many data points about what makes you go delinquent, 
right? This is a general statistical problem, right? If your data is super dense with, with zeros and very sparse with ones, you can have a problem, yeah. But hopefully your data is a little bit better than that. And there are kind of tricks to, to kind of get around this problem. So having good training data or finding your training data. Training data may be just as important as the algorithm. Yeah, I'd say it's maybe even, maybe even more important than the algorithm, right? Having good training data and, and dealing with the data really well. Right, this is why this is something that's really difficult to automate in principle, right? Um, so in principle, all this stuff could be, maybe in, in theory, all this stuff could be done automatically by a computer. You just put an R script. It's so simple, right? But unless you understand the data, you're not going to get good results right, most of the time. And maybe in your particular application, your results don't have to be as good as they could possibly be. Because you can see, you'll see, especially with random forests, you have to do very little data pre-processing. You get very good results a lot of the time, right? So this is nice for automation. Okay, let's keep on keep on track on time. Okay, so um, I think I mentioned all this stuff that that it's difficult to improve what we did unless you add a lot of computational power, right? And even if you add a lot more, lot more data points, there's incremental improvements. It's it's I think it's because of the the convergence rate of the of the um, curve fitting kind of idea here. Okay, but this is not this is not super important. But this is a drawback. I mean. Doing a neural net really well is kind of hard. Doing it decently is not so bad. Okay, now let's move on to decision trees. So a decision tree, it's also called, a, I think, a classification tree or a regression tree. Um, these are really easy to understand. Maybe the easiest machine learning algorithm in the world to understand. You're really just creating a tree, just like a, a diagram that you would use to make your own decision. Do I do this or not? This or not? This or not? Right? Um, it's extremely easy to implement, easy to understand, and it's, and it's easy to interpret, which is maybe even the most important in the business world. And the disadvantages is that it's somewhat unlikely to get the truly optimal solution, it's, uh, and it can also overfit if the, if the tree grows too long. Okay, so we'll, we'll kind of see why all that stuff happens. <coughs> so here's a simple example, um, which I just stole from Wikipedia. But I think it's really easy to understand. So this is like survivors of the Titanic. We're trying to predict who would survive or not on the Titanic. So this, um, <coughs> so basically the way that the, the way that a already trained decision tree would work to make a decision is you just go to it and you say, okay, let's take a person. Is it a man or a woman? Male or female? Okay, if he's male, you go to the left. Is his age greater than 9.5 years or not? Right. If it's yes, you go over here not over here, right? And then you just kind of go down and ask how many siblings they have, right? And eventually it makes a prediction about, about what will happen, right? Are there any questions about this? I think it's, it's not so hard to understand, right? I'm just kind of following along. And these percentages are the likelihood of, likelihood of surviving and the, um, and the percentage of observations from the training data that were in that leaf. The end is called, this is called leaf, okay? Any questions about this? the way that this would make a decision. It's very simple. Yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. And it puts a condition on each node of the tree. Okay? So how do we train it? So usually we use something called a greedy algorithm. So a greedy algorithm is, if you're familiar with computer science, it's, it's kind of trying to make a, the best possible decision at each step. And hopefully after all the steps are completed, you have a very good answer. Right? So what does that mean? Um, at each node, you split the tree by the test of whichever variable causes the most, quote, information gain. So that is, which, split, which splitting, which variable splitting would split the data most effectively. So if we go back, the biggest predictor was whether the, guy, whether the um, person was male or female, as to whether they survived or not. Right? And then the next thing is what their age was. So you split along their age. Right, you pick 9.5 for the age because it's the best possible split. It splits the most. Okay, that's what a greedy algorithm does, and that's how they work. Okay. So, are there any questions about what a greedy algorithm does and how that works? This is the standard way to train train a decision tree. The problem, of course, is that since we're trying to split by the quote most important variable at each step, it's possible that we don't get the overall best decision at the end. Right, it's actually possible that would happen. And in fact, getting the very best tree, the perfect tree to fit the data, is actually NP hard. So meaning that, well, it just means it's really hard. 
computer science wise. And there's really good. <laughs> so there's a really good deep explanation for what NP-hard means, which is so beyond the scope of this talk that it would be pretty stupid to talk about. Okay. But this is a this is apparently been proved. So the solution is is to use something called random forests. It's not a complete solution, but it really helps. So so as we know, if we're trying to pick split just by the best variable at each time, you might screw up and not get the best thing. So the solution from random forests is to repeat the process many, many times and with sub with random subsets of variables and hope that most of the time you do a pretty good job. Right? So by the way, I call this a local minimum trap. It's not it's it's sort of in the same spirit as a local minimum trap, if you're familiar with this. It's like if you're like we were talking about before with with these functions, if the derivative is zero, you're at a local minimum, most likely, right? Of course I teach calculus, so I know that's not exactly true. But you can do the first derivative test and you'll know for sure, right? But it may be that there's a lower point somewhere else, right? That you can't detect using this. Right? It's the same kind of problem with the greedy algorithm. Just your slide before if you branch on something else to begin with, you wouldn't get such a nice decision. Exactly, exactly. If you're saying if you branch on something else to begin with, you might not get as good of a decision tree, right? And luckily you did it right at the beginning, right? But it's not guaranteed that you would, right? It's hard to it's hard to select the best one. Can I can I ask a question? Do you mean the order in which you choose the variables? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yes. If you choose the wrong order, you can't go back for like backtrack. That's right. You're not allowed to backtrack. So if you if you choose the order the variables in the wrong order, then it's not gonna work. That's it's, why it's NP-hard. Yeah, it's so, so if you're familiar with computer science, it means it's a combinatorial optimization problem and therefore NP-hard. Okay, so if you don't know what that means, don't worry. Okay, so you're, you're probably happier that you didn't go to grad school and know what that is. You made a lot more money. So random forest. So what is a random forest? Well, random forest is meant to solve this greedy algorithm problem. They were introduced by, by a mathematician slash computer science a scientist named Raymond. So the method is that, as I said, you select random subsets of the variables. You do this many, many times. So small random subsets of the variables. Say you have a thousand variables. You might choose a hundred random subsets of size 10, right? And you're going to build a decision tree with each of those subsets of size 10, right? And then when you want to make a decision, so you're going to build many, many decision trees. When you want to make a decision, you run every single variable Right, or every single every single uh, data point through every single tree, right, and then you have them vote on what the classification should be, right. So the the hope, and in practice, this is this is what happens, is that most of the time, most of your decision trees, on average, are going to give the right answer, right. So this is like I call this democracy in action, right. <laughs> So, um, are there any questions about how this works? How do you check? So, go back. How do you generate those many different trees? You do each of them using this greedy algorithm, right? Okay, it's not like a Monte Carlo simulation. No, no, no. You, you just are randomly selecting random subsets of the variables. So you have like a thousand variables, and you're randomly selecting parts okay. of them and building many, many trees, which is why it's called a random forest. Okay, so okay. it could be a highly, uh, very small subset of the actual space. Exactly. Yeah, could be. Right. Uh, but you're, well, you're hoping that you do it many, many times. How well does a random forest work with a small number of variables rather well, than a large number? I think it should it should work really right. well. It should right. work very well because yeah. the total exponential space is small. Yeah, so, so, so when you take all these random subsets, you're going to end up taking, if, if this random variable space, if there's very few random variables, in principle, maybe you would select every possible subset for like a ton of different subsets, and you're filling up the space of possible choices. So you'll probably do very well. Right. So if your decision trees are smaller as a result, does that mean you're actually run faster uh, as a result of trying to use random force than you would with uh, large? Well, I mean, I don't know actually. That's a good question. I mean, I, it didn't take so long when I, when I implemented it. I think that um, random forests are not that computationally challenging, because, partly because they're extremely distributable, parallelizable. Right, as you can, it kind of makes sense, right? Because you can you can do every single decision tree kind of on a different node if you wanted to, right? So the computational part with this, with random forest is kind of nice. Okay. It's also like a great problem for map reviews. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or even, I mean, there are even simpler things you can do. Yeah. So 
sir? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're using this for a classification. You have to, you have to define the outcomes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm repeating. So the the uh, question was, do you have to define the outcomes, right? So meaning, do you have to know whether you're like surviving or not surviving? Like, it's, and usually, yes. If you're using random forest, it's going to be for that kind of classification problem, where you know what you're trying to get to. Okay. Yes. Well, when we've got a non-binary solution we're looking for, maybe a scoring system. Do these approaches work if you're trying to predict an accurate score, an outcome, maybe a, an outcome of zero to a hundred, testing somebody's goodness or truthfulness or some other non non-binary answer? Yes, I've never used random forest for for like that kind of regression, but yeah, people use them for that kind of thing. Yes, and ranking. And ranking, yeah, ranking is also another thing. You can also use random forest for deciding variable importance, which is nice. So suppose you have 40 million variables and you want to figure out which ones are the most useful, and you can use random forest to explore that and try to get some sort of idea, which is kind of nice too. Okay. All right. Let me show you an example. Um, oh yeah, we were just talking about the advantages and disadvantages. So John told me that he sent me an algorithm for in R for for doing random forest over many code or many nodes. The problem with that is that you don't get the nice error estimates, I think, and you don't get uh, the variable inference. But it's five lines of R code or something like that, so it's very easy to do that. And it's really nice. Um, and according to Brayman, it's impossible to overfit with random forest. I, I don't really believe that, because I think it's like, got to be always possible to overfit. But because of the averaging and the randomness, you are, I think you are somewhat less likely to overfit. Right? There's some advantage to that. Don't you get high your chance of overfitting with every sample? Yeah, exactly. Well, the fact that you're sampling many, many random pieces means you're less likely to overfit. So, yeah, I'm, I'm at, if you include a variable that is actually the outcome, you won't get a perfect model because yes. it doesn't pick the outcome in every four. Right, exactly. And, uh, and so, yeah, right, yeah. yeah so, so that's that's nice. Um, Okay, so let's let's look at an application really quick. So actually, this one's only one slide. It's even easier because I didn't have to do any of the of the data cleaning, right? I didn't fill in missing values and things like that. Still got a very nice, very nice uh, answer. So decision trees in random forest naturally handle missing values, um, which is an amazing amazing thing if you're working with unclean data. Um, so all I'm doing is so half of this is actually just installing the package and the library. So this is the training part. This is the random forest code right here. It's this simple. Um, so the code is just you call random forest and then you tell it what your what your data set is, what you're training for, and what kind of sample sizes you want. Okay, I trained this on the whole data set and it didn't take very long, maybe five or ten minutes or something like that. It's pretty pretty easy. Okay. Um, and uh, this is now just outputting the answers, right? It's very, very simple. Okay, it's maybe, it's too simple. Okay, right. Okay, any questions about this code or anything? It's not so tricky. You can just, for your own, for your own problem, class, a binary classification problem, you should be able to just completely copy this, and I think any simple binary classification should work. Is this running on one box? This is on my computer. Yeah, it's very fast. Very easy, very fast. My computer, like, randomly the screen turns off and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's not the greatest. I was really worried that this would happen in the middle of my talk. That it would just stop. You still have a chance. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the, so the results were remarkable, actually. So this I just stole this benchmark code from Kaggle. Of course, there's not much you can do to change it. It's very, very simple, right? So this is code that was just released, and you have to beat this to, to really feel like you're doing something. This is an 86.4% accuracy, which if you remember the neural net was only 85.5%, which was harder, took longer, um, and uh, the winner only got 87%, right? So this is pretty remarkable, using completely stock R code from Random Forest, no data cleaning, 10 lines of code, including installing the package and calling the library. Um, you got 86.4% and almost won the competition. The problem is, 
that's that's kind of bad because that means that like with this code we were the 458th place in the competition or something like that. Um, it's obviously really effective, especially compared to the to the to the simplicity of the code, right? It's so easy. Um, the problem is again, it's kind of tricky to understand where to improve, right? It's got a little bit of this black box nature, just like a neural network. The other thing is, I was talking to somebody who does analytics for for a local company, and they were making predictions with random forest, and they just couldn't they couldn't convince their bosses that it made sense, and even themselves, right? It's just it's sort of like magic, right? It feels like magic, which is not really helpful when you're trying to make a million dollar business decision, right? Even if it might be the best possible prediction, right? The great thing about statistics is that you have a good idea about where things went wrong, right, and what your errors are. There are error estimates for random forests, but they're still hard to understand, right? Um, so it's a huge, a huge issue with machine learning in general, I think, is versus statistics is it's so general that it's just kind of hard to get it sometimes. Okay, any questions about this? Yes? So if you did not know the results, that you got a percent more than what the neural network did, then would you decide to use a random forest versus neural networks? Well, I think, would you when would you decide to use random forest versus neural networks? Okay, huge number of variables, I would almost always use random forest, right? And there are a lot of other algorithms. These are just, this is just two very common ones. And if I were trying to do something for speed and accuracy without needing to know, without needing to be able to tweak the model that well, I would probably pick random forest again, right? Neural networks are nice if you're trying to get extremely, perfectly accurate, right? Like, it's, say you're, you're playing the stock market or something like that. Like that. So neural networks are used on Wall Street, right, sometimes because you can tweak them, use extremely powerful computers and get something very accurate. So like I was saying, the MS digit recognition, still neural networks are the best, right? They're extremely accurate. Um, so that's what I would say, it depends on the problem. Yes? Well, back to one of the other questions, uh, you, you typically use your friend Forrest for classification problems. Right. Uh, if you need to, to estimate the continuous function, uh, for example, a scoring problem that you mentioned, uh, the neural net or logistic regression or some other regression uh, uh, approach would be the yeah, it's much more natural. Appropriate, yes. uh, like the solution. That's right. Okay. okay. So in the world of forest, can you can you look at you know the where the forest decides each variable is important? So so. Can you look at uh, across all the, the trees in the forest and say, oh look, uh, you know, gender was was the top uh, decision point, yes. sixty three percent of the time, and, and then get some idea when you're trying to explain to your boss or something. So this is this actually is why exactly this is a very this is a very good point, and this is something I mentioned. So the random forest can do can give you idea about variable importance. So suppose you have 400 variables and you want to tell, you want to be able to tweak only five of them, right? Then random forest can give you some sort of idea about what the top five variables are. Of course, there are many other ways to do this and random forest might not be the best way for your situation, right? For, so principal component analysis is one. There's a lot of other things with really cool names, like Laplacian eigenmaps. And I'm telling you, and random matrix theory, which is what my thesis is on, uh, there has a lot of applications in so-called dimensionality reduction, which is what this is all about. Um, so you can tell the random forest to kind of output variable importance scores, right? And the way that this works is exactly what, what you're saying is that which decisions are being made with these variables and how good of a job did they do, right? So you can look at each variable and tell which ones are, in, are the most useful in most trees, Right, have the lowest error. It, it does something called out of bag estimates, which is kind of like cross validation. Right, it's looking at the small tree and how well does it compare to to the rest of the data, right, and to the other variables. And you get a small collection of variables that happen to do the best overall. So it's a it's a very nice feature of random forest. Yes. Can you get that with neural networks too by the ones that have the higher weights? Uh, the weights are a little bit trickier with that. I think I mean it is it is kind of possible, but it takes you have to really interpret them. Based on the activation function, right? So that's kind of it's a lot harder than that. I think. Yes. How do you decide how many trees to tell the algorithm to create? Yeah, that's a really good question. How many nodes do you have in your head in there? 
<laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. It's the same question as how many nodes you use in your hidden layer to hold that. Nobody really knows. No, no. Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. So it's, it's yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. This is this is another NP hard problem. <laughs> Figuring out a perfect number of trees is I, I think NP hard. Yeah. Um, and it's for the same reason because you're trying to figure out. So you're trying to figure out what what are the best number of variables? What's the best way number of samples? And there's thousands or millions of ways to do this. So it's hard to know in advance. So you just do it by experimenting. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Mike. Some curiosity. Since you looked at this competition, uh, you looked at the neural net one. You looked at the random forest. Uh, did you see people trying to do the model averaging? Yes. So this is a very. So you mean like kind of ensembling yep. models? Yes. Yeah, so this is actually a really nice thing to to talk about because I think I have two more minutes. And wait. First, let me say before I talk about this. This is my summary. I think we covered all this really easily, really well. And I wanted to say thanks to Ben Johnson for organizing. For also organizing and helping out and inviting me to speak. And thanks to Sengrid for hosting. Thanks to everybody for listening. I hope it didn't get too technical at points or not technical enough at other points. And you can email me if you have any questions or if you want me to send you the code. I'd be happy to do that. Um, and okay, Mike's question. This is the, a very nice thing to say last. So when you're doing machine learning, a lot of times the, the most effective models are a clever combination of other models. Okay, so this is called an ensembling, ensemble method. So random forest is sort of an ensemble method already. So it's combining something called bagging with decision trees, right? Um, so what you'll usually do is you'll say, okay, we'll try neural network, try random forest, we'll try Latossian we'll eigenmaps or whatever, something without something else with a cool name, support vector machines. And you try them all, you try various clever things. And then you try to combine them in a clever way to get the best answer, right? So this is a really nice, neat trick because you have maybe four models. And then you use your cross-validation, various testing, and try to figure out the cleverest way to combine these models so you get the best possible answer. And the good thing about that is you get the advantages of averaging, right? So you're averaging the, the problems with some models um, with the advantages of other models. And so it, it can turn out really nice that way. Okay, maybe I can ask, answer one more 10 second question that I need to stop. Yes. One last one, tongue in cheek. Is there an app for that? <laughs> well, I'd be able to go to my iPhone and say, if you put that $1,000 flat screen on your Visa, you've got a 75% of default in the next two years. So I'd be, I'd be happy to, to sell you one on credit. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon.